Hello, and welcome to GeoIgnite, Canada's National Geospatial Conference. Thank you all so much for being here and participating. I'm Jonathan Murphy, and I'm the chair of GeoIgnite, and I'm the managing director of GoGeomatics Canada. First, I'd like to take a moment to thank our sponsors without whom this event would not be possible and free for the entire Canadian geospatial community. Our platinum sponsor is MDA, our gold sponsors are Maxar, Spark Geo, GIS Partner, and SafeGraph. Our silver sponsors are Avenza, NV5 Geospatial, Deploy Solutions, and Minerva Intelligence. We thank them for their leadership and investment in the Canadian geospatial community. Also, a big thank you to our media and association partners and sponsors in Canada and around the world. We've come together safely online for our third year. Before we begin, it's important to acknowledge the pandemic and the suffering and loss we are all experiencing. Please stay safe. Bienvenue au Geo Ignite. Je suis Jonathan Murphy, président de la Conference, au nom de les sponsors, des intervenants et du comité de conference. Je vous remercie de participer à cet événement en ligne. Pour cette troisième année consécutive de GeoIgnite, nous avons le plaisir de vous proposer un contenu de plus en plus bilingue. Cette année, nous avons d'excellents traducteurs qui travaillent avec nous afin de pouvoir présenter la conférence en anglais et en français. Je vous invite à utiliser l'outil de traduction Zoom dans le barre du menu pour écouter l'audio française ou anglaise de la conférence. Profitez de la conférence au cours des trois prochains jours et merci encore d'être là. The conference team has put together an amazing program for you over the next three days. It's my honor now to introduce MDA's president of Geo Intelligence, our first keynote of the conference, Dr. Minda Suhan. Hello, I'm Dr. Minda Suhan, VP of Geo Intelligence here at MDA. Thank you all for joining me this morning. I am so excited to welcome you all to this year's Geo at Night 2021 Geospatial Conference. And I'm honored to open the event with this keynote presentation on the future of SAR. MDA is proud to be the platinum sponsor of Geo Ignite in 2021. And my team and I are looking forward to participating in all the wonderful sessions lined up in the next few days. So I wanted to tell you a little bit about myself. I joined MDA last year after MDA became a standalone company. And I have about 25 years of experience in the defense and intelligence community within the United States. After receiving my doctorate in chemical physics, I started working as an optical engineer on the West Coast in El Segundo, California. And I was working on large space-based electro-optical payloads mostly on the hardware side of the satellite collector. But my career really shifted to the geospatial side after my technology fellowship at the National Reconnaissance Office, where I worked in an active operations center supporting real-time intelligence missions. And that is where I started to understand how the data that was being collected was actually being used. And I recognized that in order to uh, capture the true value of our space assets, it was critical that the information pulled from the satellite collector had to be meaningful. So I shifted over to the commercial side of the business back on the East Coast, where I supported some of the commercial imaging payload development, though, of course, I was still supporting some of my national intelligence customers as well. Eventually, I ended up running a geospatial governance business with a focus on the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, NGA, and other US intelligence customers. But 
One of the reasons I moved to Canada to work with MDA was to be able to deliver value from source collection all the way to the end user platform. Previously, I was either on the data collector side or on the geospatial side, but I was never able to move across the full value chain. And by doing so at MDA, we are in a unique market position to drive value throughout the process from collection to delivery. So moving to my first slide, you can see that MDA is one of the original space pioneers here in Canada with decades of experience and knowledge. We have over three generations of radar sat satellites operating since 1995. We have over 50 plus years in telecommunication satellites, 40 plus years on the Canadian Space Robotics Program, we are a longtime provider of space solutions and mission operations to the Canadian government, and we are a global supplier of satellite systems, products, robotics technologies, and geospatial solutions. So MDA is a standalone Canadian peer space play company with offices from coast to coast. We are also really excited to have recently gone through an IPO. And now we are a publicly traded company on the Toronto Stock Exchange. So I know many of you are probably very familiar with synthetic aperture radar, but for those that are less familiar, I just wanted to give a brief introduction to the technology. SAR is an imaging radar system that uses active illumination where we select the frequency that is mostly transparent through the atmosphere from satellite to ground and back, these electromagnetic waves are transmitted, and then the echoes are collected via the spacecraft and stored for advanced processing in order to attain an image. At the end, uh, or at the line of sight direction changes along the radar platform trajectory in space, a synthetic aperture is produced, and that has the effect of lengthening the antenna, and hence we're able to get a higher imaging resolution on the image. So on the right side, you can see the different radio frequencies that are available from very low frequencies, VLF, and they're more, more or less used in the maritime navigation side uh, through extremely high frequencies, EHF, and that's used more on the radio astronomy and radar landing system side. But for satellites, we use the super high frequency band, so SHF band, and that ranges from about three gigahertz to about 30 gigahertz. And we can de further divide that band into L band, C band, X band, and K bands. And all these different bands are used for SAR imaging. So with higher frequencies and therefore correspondingly higher energies, we can penetrate deeper into various environments. That's uh, receiving additional information the deeper the signal goes. Therefore, the different bands are useful in different applications. For example, X-band will reflect off the tree canopy while the C-band will penetrate the canopy and L-band even penetrates even further. So uh, as it relates to say ice monitoring, we're able to access the ice characteristics, whether it's a new ice or a one year formed or multi-year formation. And this requires SAR to penetrate the ice and the SAR analysts can then determine the ice type and age. And in this case, C band is probably the most suitable band. Finally, uh, you can see uh, the final example there is as relates to earth and sand. So this kind of relates back to soil moisture assessments. And you find that L band is probably the most suitable in these kinds of applications. So in Canada, SAR is used for band coverage for landmass, Arctic ice, maritime applications. And additionally, as most of you know, SAR is not affected by clouds or dark darkness, uh, unlike other, uh, as other satellite sensors may be. So in Canada, historically, for example, Vancouver is mostly cloudy. In fact, it's cloudy 60% of the time in April, for example. This can drop to 30% clouds in the summer, but winters are pretty darn cloudy at most of the time. If you even go further north, it gets even more cloudy in April, and this drops only to about 50% in the summer. But again, winters are very, very cloudy, and there's insufficient daylight hours from October to February. So 
The key takeaway here is that Canada needs a sensor suitable for daylight, you know, seeing through clouds, and a broad area coverage. So uh, for more information, I want to uh, pitch my uh, workshop here for, that Ed Lau is giving. He works with me at MDA, and he, on April 27th, is giving a workshop on intro to SAR projects. So definitely products. Uh, so definitely check it out, and you can kind of see the other types of products that are produced uh, using various uh, bands in SAR. So as I mentioned previously, here are some examples of SAR images uh, in the different bands. And again, you need to be able to choose the band that works best for your application. On the left side, you can see the L-band image of Brazil. And this is focusing on the agricultural areas. This uh, image is actually taken from the advanced observing from the Advanced Land Observing Satellites, ALOS, and as the name implies, is designed for land applications. Second for the left, the image is a mosaic of Canada collecting radar sat what? Uh, it's a C-band, and this was taken over a seven-day period and, and shows the value of broad area collections. Since entering operations in 2007, uh, MDA's Radar Sat 2 has collected the area of Canada's land match, uh, which is approximately 10 million kilometers squared every two days. So the C-band SAR is used operationally for both broad area applications in ice monitoring, maritime surveillance, as well as higher resolution for smaller area monitoring, maybe in the mining side or the oil pipeline monitoring. But as you can see, as you move to the next image to the right, um, X-band data gives even higher resolution. It's less area though, uh, and, but this is a view of London, England. And in the center of the image, you can actually see the London Eye and distinguish the individual passenger capsules. Across the Thames and slightly west of London Eye, you can actually see Big Ben. So X-Band is an excellent source of very high resolution SAR data for a variety of applications, including land intelligence for defense and security applications. And finally, the last image on the right, you can see there's a K-band SAR. This, in this case, it's the KU band. It's primarily a military capability, and this is more airborne, not so much commercial space platforms. So the key takeaway here is that there is a need for both broad area and high resolution SAR data. The C and X band space, space radar uh, SAR is really proven and is in operational use. So how has SAR evolved over the years? And how do we get to, to where we are today? So the earliest SAR satellite was in the C-band through ESA with the initial SAR Mission European Remote Sensing, or ERS-1 and ERS-2, both carried C-band SAR on board. Uh, these, uh, this weighed around 2,300 kilograms where MDA provided ground segment capabilities there. Uh, CSA uh, followed shortly in 1995 uh, with RadarSat-1 that was built and operated by yours truly, MDA, with a SAR uh, mission commercialization focus. So we were really trying to focus in moving the data out of the scientific labs and academia and into real operational use. This allowed for customers from throughout the world to task and receive direct downlink of SAR data at their national ground, station, ground stations for immediate processing and exploitation. Since then, RadarSat-1 regional ground station network has grown to over 70 stations in tw over 25 countries today. In 2002, uh, Environment Satellite also carried a C-band SAR but it weighed approximately 8,100 kilograms. Note of interest that MVSAT remains the heaviest uh, weight next to, and the next uh, largest SAR satellite is just over 3,000 kilograms. So that's just a big delta there. And uh, we provided the SAR processor to MVSAT here. In 2014, ESA launched Sentinel-1A and 1B two years later. They operate as a systematic data collectors, providing valuable SAR data for a number of applications, 
including environmental monitoring and deforestation. For again, MDA, we've provided some special beam mode designs, as well as some SAR processing capabilities. Then, uh, RadarSat2 was launched in 2009, and this was a public-private partnership between CSA and MDA. Uh, RadarSat2 has been operational for over 13 years. It's in excellent health and really has become the SAR data mission of choice for many applications. RCM, a RadarSat Constellation mission, numbers one, two, and three were launched in 2019. MDA here was the prime contractor to build RCM, and we have the pleasure of operating RCM under contract for CSA, as RCM serves the broader range of Canadian government needs. So in February of this year, MDA announced that we are building a new commercial SAR mission, uh, currently called Radar Set Next, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. So moving on to the L-band, Japan has really focused on the L-band SAR satellites with GRS, GERS being the first L-band satellite. And then it was followed by ALOS, as I mentioned before, the Advanced Land Observation Satellite that was launched in 2006. Argentina also launched their first L-band SATCOM 1A with 1B following in 2016. Now, moving to X-band in 2007, both Germany and Italy launched X-band SAR missions, which offered high and very high resolution SAR data. And this hadn't been previously available with the C or L band. The German government DLR and Airbus partnered on uh, Terrasat X and Tandem X. Korea entered the SAR field in 2013 with the launch of ComSat 5, and that is also an X-band satellite. Spain launched in 2019, with PAS being again a clone of Terrasat X. And then the Italian Space Agency teamed with EGEOS for the constellation of four Cosmo SkyMed X-band satellites. Pretty impressive there as well. And finally, uh, uh, on this timeline graph, on the bottom right corner, you can start to see small sat constellations constellations entering the X-band SAR field. In 2018, we saw the first small band, uh, small sat X-band SAR launched. And this is where now we're under 100 kilograms, right? So the largest and heaviest was 8,100 kilograms. And now we're down to under 100 kilograms by ISAI in Finland. ISAI has continued to build out their constellation with, I think, close to 10 operational satellites. In 2020, Capella for Silicon Valley launched their first X-band SAR with a reflector antenna, and it's considered actually a microsat, which weighs under 40 kilograms. And now they have three operational satellites with very high resolution spotlight images as well. So on this chart, if you move to the right top graph, you can see the number of SAR satellites continuing to grow throughout the years. In the beginning, um, for the first 15 years, it's around two to four missions. It's been increasing to eight to 11 missions over the uh, next 12 years, but there's a steady rise since 2018 with a lot of uh, new satellites and the introduction of both small and microsats. So on the bottom chart, I wanted to talk a little bit about this because it's not a metric that's often discussed. We call it the SAR on time per satellite. So SAR on time is really how many minutes per orbit, right? So our orbit is approximately 100 minutes. Uh, it, it, the SAR on time metric is the amount of time that the satellite is able to image. So SAR again is an active center, sends out those radar pulses and receives the returns. SAR satellites are really generally big power consumers, right? The higher uh, the time, the SAR on time, necessitates larger power systems, more batteries, more solar panels. And, and this can drive the satellite's increase in size, weight, and of course, cost. One other key impact is that the SAR sensor is an active imaging and it can create significant heat. So larger SAR on time requires larger surface area for heat dissipation. So you just need bigger satellites. As would be expected in the early uh, missions, primarily in the C-band, the broad area collectors um, 
we had about 20 minutes of collection capacity per satellite. This dropped a little bit as X-band missions were introduced and further dropped as small sats were added. So just for example, RadarSat 2 had 28 minutes SAR on time, which means it can collect SAR data for about 28 minutes out of the 100 minute orbit. EGOS and Terrasat X are both under 10 minutes per 100 minute orbit. Comsat, Isid, and Capella are under five minutes per 100 minute orbit. So kind of the secondary issue that the smaller SARS for the smaller SAR satellites is that they're designed for a smaller area but higher resolution imaging. So it's kind of like a strip map or spotlight modes. And uh, this just carries a much narrower swath width. So why is this significant? Uh, so we at MDA choose to leverage a larger SAR satellite, especially when the primary use cases are is really focused on broad area surveillance, where we need the largest satellite with a higher SAR on time metric and a wider swath width to meet our customers' needs. So from this chart, you can say that the key takeaway is that the number of satellites are increasing, each with their own unique capability. So you get broader area with C and L bands and higher resolution with the X band. And I think uh, we want to definitely emphasize that, you know, we understand that the need that there has to be a mix of these requirements in order to meet both the current and future SAR customer needs. So moving on, you know that SAR today is very operational. It's being used in a variety of applications from detecting illegal fishing to detecting illegal forestry, providing humanitarian aid to disaster relief efforts. Uh, we use SAR in monitoring the Arctic and Antarctic ice erosion relative to climate change. We support uh, national, natural resource industries and of course, we continue to protect our critical infrastructures. In a more recent example, you can see and maritime monitoring. Here on the left, we see the broader image that then is zoomed in on the right, showing the Suez Canal and the ever given cargo ship blockage. So what is the future of SAR? Where, where are we going? Well. MDA is excited to announce our major new initiative to build a commercial Earth observation a satellite mission. And we're currently referring to it as SARNEX, though a more formal name will be announced at a later time. This satellite mission will be based on our leading space-based C-band SAR imaging uh, technology. It will provide operational continuity for our existing radar set to customers, including commercial, government, and institutional communities. And we're gonna be continuing to carry forward the strong attributes of Canada's radar set program, while at the same time, bringing innovative new technologies and operational concepts to deliver a significantly enhanced world leading capability. On the right, you can see that uh, sneak peek illustration of our new satellite, along with our current ground station network that will bring SAR geospatial data, products, and analytics to current and future customers. So thank you so much for the opportunity to share MDA's SAR story with you. And a special thank you to the conference coordinators for bringing the community together to talk about geospatial collaboration throughout Canada. Hi, Dr. Suhan. Thank you so much. A great presentation. Thank um, you very much. I'm happy to be here. Yeah, it's very exciting to have you as our keynote. Um, very exciting to have MDA as our platinum sponsor. We appreciate the support. Um, we've got some questions already uh, coming in through the QA, but I've got a couple of questions I thought uh, might be interesting to start with. Um, you were talking about the launch of a new satellite. 
Can you give us any more details or when that might be happening? So absolutely, uh, we are very excited uh, about our investment here and moving forward with uh, the development of the next generation SAR satellite. Um, it's gonna be, uh, you know, we recently announced that uh, we're gonna be investing in this as a company. And uh, once we turn public, it would be uh, even more exciting as we, we move forward here. Uh, I would say that in, in, in what we're doing right now with uh, SAR Next is we just uh, finished a key milestone of the preliminary design review, uh, so the PDR. And so we are, but we're still kind of evaluating and assessing our customer needs against where we want to go relative to the mission. So uh, still some details to be fleshed out in the coming weeks and months. So, uh, but, uh, so just stand by, we'll have more announcements and more details to come as, uh, as we move forward in our plans and our program. But we certainly appreciate that this next uh, STAR mission will change how and how, how you see the world today. Thanks so much. So let's move over to the live Q&A and see what we've got. Okay, let's see. Um, can SAR be used to measure the thickness of ice accumulation and categorize the different types? So from my understanding, uh, not, I'm not a, a SAR analyst expert. And if you really want to find out the details, again, I encourage people to check out Ed's Lau workshop on April 27th here at Do Ignite. But from my understanding, uh, yes, we are able uh, to use C-band to do that kind of ice characterization. Yeah, that's my understanding as well. Um, there's another question coming in from Jeff Zeiss. Uh, thanks for your question, Jeff. Uh, Landsat data is open and free. Is, is any MDA SAR data available in a similar way? So certainly, uh, we we appreciate that um, uh, people uh, can find data and leverage data in, in a variety of ways. Uh, we certainly uh, uh, work with the Canadian government, and we share a lot of that data as well, especially with our PPP, the public-private pri uh, partnership that I uh, talked about and referred to, in which we developed Radar Sat too. But uh, we are a, a, a public and uh, for-profit company. So we do have a commercial business model associated with the data. And so the way that we distribute depends on our customers' needs and you know where their interests lie. So we work pretty closely with them. But in terms, uh, and certainly we work with certain, certain academia and different universities to, to provide uh, data sets that are of interest as well. So uh, I, I would say that uh, sometimes by exceptions, we, we work with different communities to offer our data out to the community, especially when there's a keen interest in the area or there are you know, critical reasons to release it. But we also have uh, uh, responsibilities to our, our shareholders to be a, a commercial provider. Absolutely. Um, is there an effort, um, there's, there's um, a lot of small satellites going up. Um, in relation to SAR, can you tell us a little bit about, uh, there seems to be just more and more SAR happening and, and definitely MDA is the leader, um, I would say in this area in the history of it. Can you tell us more about um, regarding the small sats and SAR? Absolutely. Well, uh, we certainly appreciate uh, the, the small set revolution that's occurring. We think there's a lot of great technology that's happening in that arena. Uh, I think that uh, small sets kind of lends itself to a variety of different uh, applications and sensors, uh, depending on where the technology sits today. And so I kind of grew up on the electro optical side. And so we were kind of keen and excited about some of the small set technology that has evolved such that we could start to consider smaller payloads that still can be effective. I will say that we've seen a lot more uh, small satellite technology in the X band, because again, you get that very high resolution uh, focused on a specific area. So I think um, small sets can certainly help meet a lot of variety of missions. But I, we do find that depending on what your missions need, kind of 
dictates whether or not you can move more towards a small set or if you have to stay with a slightly, if you need a broader coverage, you might need a slightly larger, larger satellite. And so for us, what we're excited about is because of all these evolving technologies and the different satellites that are coming out, that we think there's a lot of ways that you can start to uh, unlock additional value through looking at fusion of data or combinations or overlays of data uh, on the analytics side and start to produce uh, additional informational products that help meet your mission as well. Thank you, great. Um, I have a question about um, SAR in terms of training and human resources and where, uh, is MDA working in any areas? Like uh, when I studied SAR uh, in grad school, I quickly learned SAR is hard. It's polarizations, it's not optical. Um, it was definitely difficult to come to. Uh, and now I did it like 15, 20 years ago. Um, does MDA have training programs or anything available for, for uh, de government departments or private organizations? Uh, Certainly yeah. we, well, in terms of SAR, we certainly recognize that depending on the maturity of the user, right? How familiar they are with the technology, we want to work with our customers to make sure that they have full access to the entire value associated with the SAR image. And so we do have uh, trainers and courses that we've developed in-house and, and work with our customers to make sure that they understand the value. We do workshops like here at Geo Ignite and talk a little bit about that. We certainly have worked with uh, universities to go in and teach more about uh, SAR imagery and the ways that you can uh, gain more value from certain imageries as well. Uh, so, uh, so absolutely that uh, there's course material available and we work with our customers to provide those kind of training materials as needed. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we've come to the end of the uh, time for our Q&A, just an absolutely fantastic keynote. I'm so i um, glad to have been able to welcome you here as the keynote and our platinum sponsor, um, Dr. Suhan. Thank you very much. Um, please enjoy the rest of the conference. Absolutely. Thank you so much, John. I really appreciate the opportunity. And it's just a wonderful introduction to all the great things Canada does in geospatial. Thank you very much. Okay, everybody, we're heading into a short break. I'm going to be playing the break video, and on the other side, we're going to be uh, getting a presentation from the CEO of Spark Geo on the geospatial product trap. See you on the other side, everybody.